Good evening, everyone. It is six o'clock, so we're going to get started. I'd like to welcome everybody to Fungus Among Us, getting started with mushroom identification. Um, my name is Heather Obera, and I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator for Alachua Conservation Trust. I'm joined tonight by with uh, Sarah Prentice and Philip Thompson of the Florida Academic Lichen and Fungi Enthusiastics League. And before we get started, I just have a few um, uh, clerical things I just want to go over, and then I'm going to turn it over to Sarah and Philip. Uh, they've got a great presentation for us this evening. Uh, first and foremost, if you're new to um, ACT or haven't heard of us before, um, we are a nonprofit accredited land trust. Our work is to protect the natural, scenic, historic, and recreational resources in and around North Central Florida. And we protect land through purchase, donation, and conservation easements in 16 different counties. Also, a big part of our mission is environmental education, which is why we're doing this presentation this evening. Uh, this uh, presentation is part of our Keep Florida Wild virtual series. And if you'd like to support uh, future environmental education programming like tonight's talk, uh, you can make a donation by texting Florida Wild to 44321, and it helps support programs like the one that we're going to see tonight. Uh, so uh, if you have to duck out a little early tonight, or if you know somebody who wasn't able to watch the presentation uh, this evening, we will be placing a recording of this presentation on our website at www.alachuaconservationtrust.org slash keep FL wild. We are also broadcasting to YouTube and the presentation will be available on um, our YouTube channel for Alachua Conservation Trust immediately after the presentation concludes tonight. So please feel free to share that with anybody who's interested in learning more about mushroom identification. Uh, following tonight's presentation from Sarah and Philip, we will have a Q&A session. So please feel free to type your questions into the chat box, or you're welcome to type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll only be answering those questions that come in through the chat or the Q&A. So if you raise your hand, we're not able to answer those questions, but please feel free to type in your questions anytime throughout the presentation, and I'll have them written down so that we can ask questions of Sarah and Philip uh, later on this evening. Our presentation uh, will run until 7.30 tonight. Uh, so again, if you can't stick around for the whole thing, feel free to check out the recording uh, once it's available. Um, and without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers this evening and turn it over to them. Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome to Fungus Among Us, getting started with Mushroom ID. So this evening we will be talking about a number of things. We're going to start with some basic fungal biology. We'll discuss the major morphological groups of fungi and some of their defining characteristics. We'll discuss how to make a spore print. We'll talk about the use of simple dichotomous keys. I have mine printed out here. We will talk about online and print resources for further learning because there's only so much we can go over in 90 minutes. And if there is time at the end of the presentation, uh, I have made some slides for three distinctive easily identified edible mushrooms, which is what I'm gonna assume many people's interest is, is the edible ones. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. So let's just talk about what fungi are to begin with. Um, let's take it back to high school biology for a little bit. Fungi have five characteristics. They are eukaryotes they have a nucleus and organelles in their cells. This is as opposed to bacteria. Bacteria are prokaryotes, so fungi are not bacteria. Fungi are heterotrophic. That means that they obtain nutrients from other organisms. They can't make their own nutrients like plants do. Plants are autotrophs. They can make their own food. They must, fungi have to obtain their nutrients from other organisms. Fungi also have absorptive nutrition, so they secrete enzymes and digest food outside of their bodies before absorbing it. Fungi have a chitin cell wall. They have chitin in their cell walls. Um, they don't have cellulose. Plants have cellulose in their cell walls. And interestingly, chitin is the same substance that's found in the exoskeletons of arthropods and crustaceans. 
So this chitin cell wall fungi are not plants. We used to think they were plants, but we now know differently. So fungi are not bacteria, fungi are not plants, they're not animals, they're their own kingdom, their own unique kingdom. And finally, fungi have indeterminate growth. So theoretically, an individual fungus can live forever, theoretically. So you might have heard about the humongous fungus out in Oregon. It's the largest single living organism on earth. Note that it's organism, not animal. Um, it's estimated between 2,000 and 8,000 years old. So many fungi are multicellular, probably most of the ones that you notice with the naked eye, they're all multicellular. Their bodies are made of microscopic filaments called hyphae, and a mass of these hyphae is called a mycelium. So if you've ever turned a log over and seen those branching white threads, that's mycelium or even, even bread mold. You see moldy bread, you see that mycelium, you see all the hyphae. So mushrooms are the reproductive structures or, or fruiting bodies. You'll hear fruit body or fruiting body frequently used to refer to mushrooms. They're the reproductive structures of a larger hidden fungus. And so picking a mushroom is more like picking the fruit off of a tree rather than pulling up a plant, for example, because you're not disturbing, you're, you're not harming the fungus because that mycelium is, it's hidden. It's either in the log, in the wood, it's in, you know, in the soil. So unicellular fungi are called yeasts and we can thank them for many of our favorite foods and drinks, bread, wine, beer, cheeses, kombucha, all fungal foods. And most fungi reproduce by spores. And these spores can be either asexual or sexual. And many fungi can produce two or more types of spores. If you get really in to mushroom identification, you might start looking at spores under a microscope. And just like with their fruiting bodies, the diversity of spores is incredible. And you can see here this puffball being hit by raindrops emitting clouds of dusty spores into the air. You probably kicked those over in the woods as a child or maybe as an adult. So like I said earlier, fungi is its own kingdom, kingdom fungi. And underneath the taxon underneath kingdom is phylum. And most of the known fungal diversity is in two phyla the Ascomycota and the Basidiomycota. And these phyla, the phyla are defined by their sexual spores. And there are other phyla like um, the common bread mold, Rhizopus stolonifer, is in a different phylum. It's in the Mucoromycota. And we're not gonna worry about that. We're just gonna worry about Ascos and Basidios for now. And so the phylum, the phyla are defined by their sexual spores. So ascomycota, ascomycetes, they form their sexual spores in sacs called asci. The singular is ascus. So the ascus is the sexual spore bearing cell produced in ascomycete fungi. And it usually contains eight spores. Um, so the highly desirable morel mushroom, which unfortunately does not occur in Florida, have to drive up to about mid-Georgia to find some morels, but uh, it's a well-known ascomycete fungus. Now, the phylum Basidiomycota, when you think of a mushroom with that, you know, classic kind of umbrella shape, that's, it's a Basidiomycete. So in Basidiomycetes, rather than forming their spores inside a sac, they form them on these club-shaped cells called basidia, which the singular is basidium. So they usually produce four spores and gild mushrooms, bull eats, puff balls, the polypores, jelly fungi that Philip, Philip's gonna talk about, all these major morphological groups shortly. These are all in this phylum. It's an incredibly diverse group. Fungi in general are incredibly diverse. So fungal ways of living. 
Fungi can be pathogens. Uh, they can be pathogens of plants. If you look at um, right here, this is Ustilagomitis, which is a fungal pathogen of corn. And it's considered a delicacy in Mexico. They call it huitlacoche. Um, fungi can be pathogens of humans. Think about if you've ever had athlete's foot, that's, that's a fungus. And uh, fungi can be pathogens of each other. Sometimes fungi parasitize other fungi. We're gonna talk about some of those. Uh, some fungi live as saprobes. They're decayers of organic matter, particularly wood. And just think about what the planet would look like without wood decay. So fungi have a, a huge significance in just maintaining um, the ecosystem with that decay. Uh, fungi also can live symbiotically. They can have mutualistic relationships with other organisms. So ectomycorrhizal fungi, we'll call them ECM fungi frequently. Um, they live in this mutually beneficial relationship involving nutrient exchange with trees. You might have heard of the, the wood wide web here. Um, so that is one way that fungi can live as symbionts. Also lichens. Lichens are another fungal symbiosis. And then we have some shiitakes here living saprobically on logs. So I'm going to turn it over to Philip to discuss some of these major morphological groups, and then we'll get into some of their defining features and how to identify. Hello. So grouping these by superficial morphological features helps us when we start with an identification process. Um, just because a mushroom has gills or it has pores doesn't mean it's necessarily related, but a lot of the guides that you would be using and a lot of the keys that you will find, you know, start by grouping these. And so one of the first ones, and one of the biggest ones that we all notice are these gilled mushrooms. Um, you'll see incredible uh, diversity in how these mushrooms are gilled. Um, you can see in these pictures right here that um, some go down all the way to the stem, some stop at the stem, and we'll talk about all those connections later. But it's just important to know that when you go out and you're collecting mushrooms for the identification table, you know, you're going to be grouping all of your gilled mushrooms together, basically. Um, they have true gills on the cap. Um, you can usually remove these gills without uh, damaging the cap. Um, so that'll help it differentiate from our next one. These are chanterelles and trumpets. Uh, these are highly desirable edibles. Um, these are the ones that a lot of people first learn when they're out you know, trying to collect for the table. Um, they have gills, forks, and branches on the gill. Uh, they have gills that fork and branch and are veiny. Um, they're tightly adhered to the cap. You can't really remove them without damaging the cap. Sometimes they have aromas. Uh, apricot is one that's thrown out there. The ones in Florida don't smell as much as like the ones in North Carolina. Um, some of them are actually really smooth, startlingly smooth. They don't appear to have any kind of forks or ridges or anything. Um, a lot of a fun thing to do with these is you can kind of peel them and they'll do like a, they'll peel like string cheese. So that's a one way that people uh, identify them. Um, these are bolites. Uh, bolites are really neat. They're a study onto themselves. You could spend your entire life studying bolites and probably never learn, will never learn everything about them. There's still plenty of them in Florida. They're actively being described. Even as we speak, they're you know, new to science. Um, you may have never noticed that a mushroom has pores instead of gills, you know, if you've just walked by it and never flipped it over. But basically, this would be like if you, you know, took some straws and you cut them across, you would be able to see inside the pores. And that's where the spores are released from. Um, as she said before, they're basidiospores. Um, they're usually terrestrial. There's a couple that grow on wood. There's actually a couple that even have gills, but you know, you'll know you figure those out when you can buy them, the gilled bully, for instance. And these are polypores. They grow on wood. They're pretty woody themselves. Um, a lot of them have pores. Some of them have these elongated maze-like pores. Um, some of them have uh, 
what could be called guild, the guild polypore. Um, you can't really scrape off the pores on these. I mean, they're going to be hard. It's going to be long lasting. A lot of times in wintertime when it hasn't rained, you know, these are what you're going to find when you're going out to collect. Um, they usually are, they us they're usually decomposing the wood they live on. Um, these are tooth fungi. These are really neat. These are some of my favorite. So as you can see on the bottom, uh, the cap, instead of having gills or pores, they have teeth where they eject the spores. Um, the heresium on the far right upside corner is almost entirely teeth, pretty much. Um, there's a lot of good edibles in those, these, uh, these hydnums up in the top left. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, Puffballs and earth stars are really neat. They're a gastroid type of fungus. Um, you usually see them growing gregariously in like wood and uh, grass litter, mulch. Um, the one in the top uh, center is pretty interesting to me. Um, when it fully matures, those little fans or stars out there, the exoperdium, they will, they will basically go down and lift the mushroom off the ground so that it has more effective spore dispersal. Um, there's a lot of edible ones in this that people might call puffballs. The one on the left isn't edible. <laughs> Just point that out. Stinkhorns. Stinkhorns are really great. You, I often smell them before I see them. And it's really strange because now that I notice the scent of them, I can kind of differentiate an actual dead animal versus a stink horn, but they start off in an egg stage and that egg stage doesn't really stink. As they fully mature, they start to smell really bad like rotting flesh. Um, they attract like carrion beetles and flies and they actually get this stucky mass all over them called a gleba and it kind of sticks to their legs and as they fly around, uh, that's how they get the spores. There's a great diversity in here and they're always interesting and fun to find. Clubs and corals, this is ones that, you know, they kind of, like corals, they say they look like something that should be growing on the ocean, but instead they're growing on the first floor. Uh, a lot of these that look similar are completely unrelated. Um, they're, I asked for some information on one of these one time and I got sent like 1200 PDFs on identification of clubs and corals. And like, okay, never mind. Um, you have to pay a lot of attention to uh, their, their branching. A lot of times you have to get down to the spores. But uh, I've been in North Carolina where these ones on the top left are just covering the ground and red and uh, orange and yellow clump fungus. And it's these were uh, these also these coral ones on the bottom left and the top right. You'll just see them everywhere in places in North Carolina. And you can even find them in Florida, just not in that much of an abundance, but they're really interesting. Um, cup fungi, uh, another group of mushrooms that all kind of look similar, but are nowhere near related. The spore factory is on the top of the mushroom instead of being on the bottom. Um, sometimes you can pick these up and you can kind of just blow them on a little bit and they'll release their spores. A lot of them, you know, it's kind of environmentally activated, their spore releases. Um, these are jelly fungi. These are really interesting. Um, they're gushy and gelatinous and just kind of wet and moist. Um, they can de they persist for like, uh, they'll dehydrate. And then when it rains, they will um, uh, rehydrate and start releasing spores all over again. Um, so people, there's some edible ones in here, like this uh, one on the top left, uh, you can usually find in Asian stores and put some sweet and sour soups and stuff. Uh, bird nest fungi, those are really interesting. So they kind of start out in like a egg-ish type thing. As they mature, they open and they have these little things that look like nests inside of them. Uh, they're distributed by the rain. Uh, if you go on YouTube, sorry, if you go on YouTube, you can find a Metallica video that's played to these being uh, blasted into the air by raindrops and it's pretty entertaining. Crust fungus are just tightly adhered to the wood. They're really hard to identify. You know, you, you get a lot of specialists in these. Um, a lot of time they take uh, looking at spores and the microscopic features to figure out what they are. But tightly adhered, basically, 
you almost can't remove it without destroying it. There was what we call resupinate growth. Resupinate growth just kind of spreads along. Sometimes they'll fan out and make little shelves, but sometimes they just stay tightly affixed. Um, there are a lot of diversity there. If you wanted to specialize in these, this would be something that like 20 people in the world would specialize in. <clears throat> these are morels and false morels. Uh, the one on the left is a you know a true morel. It uh, grows. It basically releases the spores from those grooves and ridges down there. Um, a lot of them, these are asco spores. They go in relationships with trees. You can't really cultivate them. That's why they're so valuable. The season's kind of short, so you got to get them when they're good. You got to find them. Be really expensive in the store. Um, these other ones on the far right, these Havella, these are interesting too. A lot of times they're called names like Dryad Saddles. Uh, we don't have any morals in Fuller, but we do have some Havella and they're always fun to find. Carbons and crusts, I guess they're called carbons because they you know, kind of look like charcoal. Um, kind of unremarkable, but I always like to find them. Uh, this one on the far right, you'll see this diatribe. Those would be everywhere all the time. Now that you've seen them, you'll be noticing them everywhere. Uh, variable, rough like sandpaper. Um, not really anything anybody's going to eat in here. <laughs> uh, parchment fungus. Uh, these would be like things like your false turkey tail, your Sterium austria. Kind of got like the pliability of like a nail, like a toenail. Um, they've got no, no tubes or pores. Usually it's kind of the smooth underside or something that you're gonna need like a high hand lens to see at least. And then, uh, truffles, most of us have heard truffles. Truffles are anything, truffle oil, truffle salt. Um, the true white truffles can sell for thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. There's a lot of things in there that aren't tr edible truffles necessarily, like deer truffles and whatnot. Um, you're not really gonna find these unless you really go looking for them because they're gonna grow along the roots of trees and they release their spores underground. So unless you're really looking for these, you're not necessarily gonna find them. Uh, we do have some species of truffle in Florida. They're not as culinarily desirable as some other ones, but they're here and people do find them and eat them. Cordyceps are similar. These are really great. I mean, they grow on bugs, moth pupae, they grow on caterpillars, they grow on spiders, they grow on other mushrooms, um, they grow on truffles. Uh, they're, just, they're just really neat. And here again, it's a study onto itself. You know, they're always finding new ones of these all the time as they, you know, start to do DNA analysis on them. Um, it's one of my favorites to find in the woods. I mean, I just, they're like, <laughs> hypomyces and similar. Hypomyces would be like a parasite fungi that lives on another fungi. Uh, one of the most common ones is the bolete eater, um, but you can find them on lactarius. You can find them on uh, a, a whole host of mushrooms, amanitas. Um, they look, if you do get into looking at things under a microscope, make sure you look at these because they can look pretty heavy metal with their crazy like branching and like chicken foot type hyphia and whatnot. Um, one of my favorite things to look at. They're mold-like, so sometimes you poke them and they're kind of gross. Um, so that's one thing. Um, but yeah, just if you are out looking for edible mushrooms and you're turning all over your mushrooms, they look like they have this gross mold all over them. And that's what it is. Uh, bonus lichens. I really like lichens <laughs> because you know, they persist for many seasons. So if it's dry and there's nothing really out there, you know, fungi-wise to fungi-wise to entertain me, I will look at these. They're kind of a mutualistic relationship between a fungi and an algae or cyanobacteria. Um, they can have ascospores. They can have basidiospores. Some of them make me little mushroom-like fruiting bodies. Um, this one that you might see that's top center, that's a Christmas lichen. Um, you can see huge fruiting bodies of, or huge bodies of it uh, um, all over the tree. It's very noticeable, obviously, because it's red and white. Um, but just really interesting. If you're, you know, if you want to learn something a little bit different, definitely pick up a lichen book and, and take it around. It's a, it's a whole field of study unto itself.
Uh, bonus or slime molds. Um, they're fungi-esque, honorary fungi, but they're not really fungi at all. They're amoebas. They grow in the same environment as mushrooms. So a lot of times they're studied by the mycologist. Um, if you go on YouTube, you can find some interesting time-lapse photos of these growing in really unique ways and some interesting experiments about how they essentially make intelligent decisions without really a ner central nervous system. They're quite fascinating. They produce spores. And instead of having chitin, they do have the cellulose and they release spores. Um, so yeah, just kind of interesting. Thank you, Philip. Um, so now we're gonna go a little deeper into a few of these major morphological groups, um, specifically the ones that are shaped like what we usually consider a mushroom. So this is a very handy diagram that's from Mushrooms of the Southeastern United States, uh, one of the Bissette field guides, always highly recommended. Uh, so here we have the bully and here is the pore surface, it's tubes. The spores are produced in these tubes. They drop out the pores. It's just this spongy, fleshy underside. And here is an example of an Amanita. Um, some mushrooms when they're smaller, particularly members of the genus Amanita, they have this, uh, we'll call it a universal veil. It's a membrane that encases it. It protects the immature mushroom. And as that mushroom grows, it's gonna tear that membrane. It's gonna bust out of it. And so sometimes it'll leave a cup at the bottom. It'll sometimes leave these warts or patches on top. Sometimes they stick around, sometimes they don't. Uh, often mushrooms will have another membrane. We'll call that a partial veil frequently. And it's protecting the immature fertile surface, the, either the gills or the pores or, and as the mushroom grows, eventually that's gonna tear as well. And that's what you'll see as a ring on mushrooms is the remnant of the membrane that was at one point protecting the gills. And then we have our tooth fungi, which can have some interesting textures on the top. Here's just, here they are again, this is, um, more of the chanterelle here, those short, blunt, elevated lines, kind of more like wrinkles or folds or veins than um, what we typically think of as gills. Sometimes they're um, characterized as false gills. It's a little contentious, true versus false gills. People like to argue about it, but um, it's, it's, a, it's a good way to think about it when you're starting out. So, how do the gills attach to the stem? They can be totally free from the stem. There can be an empty space where the gills end and the stem starts. They can run down the stem. They can um, be attached with a little notch. These are all things that you want to notice when you're looking at a mushroom. Same with how the cap is shaped. And often the cap morphology, the cap shape will change with age. Um, but does it, is it kind of funnel shaped? Is it almost like triangular? Think about all of these things when you're examining a mushroom. So here's a good example. You can see here on this pluteus, the gills are free, free from the stem. And pluteus, it grows on wood. It's got these pinkish gills and the gills are free from the stem. Those are basically your major identifying characteristics of that genus. Now here we have decurrent gills and look at these, look how far they're running down. It's just two examples of gill attachment. Here's some conical cap morphology. It's a very cone-shaped cap. You can also see it, it's a little tacky to the touch. Umbilicate cap morphology. This is always fun because umbilicate, it's like a belly button as opposed to umbonate. Umbo, it's basically that kind of nipple on top, the umbo. And then cap surface. Think about the texture on top. Is it smooth? Here's this um, penis, this uh, penis velutinus. Velutinus is in velvety. It's got this very, very velvety cap. And then here is our local version of the ubiquitous Amanita. 
Um, and you can see these kind of warts, these patches on top. And those are the remnants of that protective membrane from when the mushroom was immature. Another thing to think about is the cap surface. This was like snotty almost, <laughs> basically. It was, it was really, really glutinous, slimy. Uh, same here. Or is it just kind of tacky? Is it totally dry? A lot of things to consider. And then the cap margin, margin just the edge of the cap. Is it totally smooth? Is it scalloped? Sometimes with age, they'll crack, they'll become rimos. Appendiculate, that's again, the remnants of that universal veil. And that can kind of be just shreds of tissue or almost like powdery. So here's an example of a crenate or a scalloped edge. And check out these gills too. They're serrated like a, like a bread knife, like a serrated knife. And that's really distinctive of this uh, Lintonellus, this genus Lintonellus. Here's an Amanita with a cap margin that we would characterize as striate, which just means it has lines going all the way around. And you can kind of see it's got a little bit of an umbo here. Not a really pronounced impressive umbo, but you can see it. Here's another Amanita that we would call appendiculate, and it's just got this powder everywhere. Very, very characteristic. Then we have gill spacing. Uh, are the gills really close together, just packed, or are they pretty far apart? Stem and ring shapes, more things to observe. Um, this is, it's really important that when you're trying to identify a mushroom, that you're looking at the entire specimen, that you didn't just, you know, break it off and leave part of it in the soil. Um, because some mushrooms, they have a cup, you know, or an egg or a vulva, we'll call that a vulva. They have a rooting stem that goes down. I've seen mushrooms that kind of have a mushroom root. It's not a root in the plant sense, but it's got this rooting stem inches below the surface. Or rhizoids, which are kind of like little cords. And then that partial veil that membrane that at one point protected the immature fertile surface. W what's it doing? Is it pendant? Is it like a skirt? You know, is it, is it cobwebby? We're gonna see some cobwebby ones. Is there nothing at all? Lots of mushrooms don't have that. Won't have any of these and that's another thing to notice. Or was there a ring at one point but it was just really, really delicate and you can just kind of see where it might've been like a ring zone. So here's an Amanita. Take a look at that cup here. It was important to get that up because if we didn't have, if we'd cut it off here, we would have lost one of the major identifying features. This is a ring that I would characterize as pendant to flaring. It's pretty skirt-like. Looks a little appendiculate too. And then here we have a Cortinarius and definitely cobwebby. And you can see on the younger specimen here, that the cobweb is still pretty intact, still protecting those young gills. Whereas this one that's more developed, it's been torn away. And then the stem shape, here's our Amanita persicina again. There is no cup here, but it is a very bulbous base. That's a thing to notice. And then here is this Udamanciella that was had this um, rooting stem. So I'm gonna turn it over to Philip for some more identifying characteristics. Okay, so some things you wanna take note of when you're in the field uh, collecting these is, uh, you know, the, the flesh of the mushroom, is it hollow, is it solid, does it have color changes? If you bruise the gills, does any latex um, come out. There's a nibble and spit test where you, you nibble a bit, a little bit of the mushroom and spit it out. Is it sweet? Is it acrid? Um, some of them have really distinctive foul odors. There's beliefs that smell like ashtrays. There's gilled mushrooms that I smell like I don't know what, how to describe it, just as terrible. Um, you want to take note of how it's growing. Are they growing in groups? Are they growing solitary? Are they attached at the stem? 
Um, what kind of what kind of substrate is that? What we call what they're growing out of? Is it terrestrial? Is it on the wood? Some of them grow out of very specific things like magnolia seed pods. Um, some of them grow out of dung. Uh, some of them like leaf litter or dead grass litter, like uh, the giant puff balls that you see from up north. Those like to grow in dead grass. Um, what kind of trees are nearby? There's very specific associations with some of these mushrooms. There's a chanterelle that only grows with hackberry trees. And if you didn't pay attention to what trees around, you might not be able to identify that mushroom. Um, what time, but they're diverse all the way around the world. They, some like cold weather, some like hot weather. Um, sometimes you find amanitas when it hasn't rained in a month. Um, Cause you know, they grow from the roots of the trees, so there's got to be moisture there somewhere, I think. Um, but just in general, anything you can take about this mushroom that you find in the field and take notes about it, because once you remove it to take it back, and you're not necessarily going to remember all these little details that might be important when you're using keys or guides to, to identify these. So next. Um, so this is just kind of an example of why some mushrooms get the word common names. So we have milk caps. Uh, this is a delicious one that we you find in Florida, Lactiflus hygrophoroides. Um, then we have, so no, a problem, important thing about these is sometimes the gill, sometimes the milk uh, changes colors. Sometimes it stains the gills a certain way. Uh, sometimes it tastes a certain way or smells a certain way. And that can be important to finding exactly what kind of milk cap you have. Um, the ones on the right are called brittle gills. And they're called that because you can literally snap them, the gills, they all fall apart when you're trying to handle them. They're a fun one to throw at a tree and watch explode because they just shatter into them in pieces. They actually got a microscopic reason that they're so brittle. The hyphia kind of forms sphere-like structures and those just kind of make it brittle because they create a lot of open space in there. Crooping, a trooping crumble cap. This is an interesting one. You'll usually find these just these massive fruiting bodies running down logs and whatnot. Um, they're definitely a crumble cap. You have a hard time trying to remove them from the, the, the tree without them just, you know, crumbling all to pieces from you. Uh, so that's why that has that common name. Amanita, this is an example of one that bruises bright red and smells like anise, so it's very identifiable. Um, should have no idea, you should have no problem identifying this, but if you didn't know to cut into it or to smell it, you're gonna be missing some important identification characteristics. Here is a vast amount of ways that things can smell. Some of these can be tastes as well, but uh, old timey mycologists spend a lot of time definitely narrowing down some of these. Sewer gas, that's an interesting one. <laughs> um, okay, next. Collecting tips. Um, so I, you know, I know we call them field guides, and some of them are good to you know carry into the woods. But in Florida, I very rarely find myself carrying a book into the woods and trying to sit among the mosquitoes and identify this mushroom. I get sweat all over it. I get my book all dirty. And so what I like to do is you carry a flat bottom, usually what a basket. If it's, you're collecting really small fungus, one of those tackle boxes for fishing works really well. You wanna make sure you excavate the entire mushroom. So like Sarah was saying, this volvo down there you can have features, be cleft or you know all kinds of real powdery, real faint. Um, it can be important for identification. So I like to kind of take them and I wrap them in some wax paper and kind of create this little cocoon. Uh, collect several species, several different stages of maturity from the same species. You don't have to collect them all. And then you basically, this wax paper in the bottom of your basket helps them get all, um, keep them all separated. Sometimes if I'm collecting things for identification and known edibles, I'll carry a separate bag that just has the edibles that I'm looking for. That way they don't get all mixed together and you don't want any nasty amanita bits all over your edible mushrooms. Um, why do we use scientific names? I know we haven't used a lot of them in this presentation, trying to keep it really simple, but the common names aren't consistent about area, uh, among culture, and some of the poisonous ones are the same name as some of the edible ones. So it's just better to try and get that nomenclature down. Um, after It can be really intimidating. It's like learning a new different language. 
Most people, when they start, use the common name to get back to the scientific name. But if you stick with it enough at times, you'll start to realize what some of these prefixes and what some of these suffixes mean. Um, some species don't even have a common name. Uh, the Audubon Guide, a lot of the names in there were just kind of made up because they wanted every one of those mushrooms to have a common name and then they just kind of carried down. Um, so that's why we use scientific names. Uh, spore prints, this would be a, a lot of keys start or have these spore print colors somewhere in their key. And so basically, um, uh, you would put this mushroom on a white piece of paper, or a colored piece of paper, so you'd be able to see what spore what spores are dropped, um, and then you're going to know what color it is. Sometimes if you get into microscopy, you just put them right on the slide, that way you can look at them. Um, some of them are really cool and green. Uh, there's the chlorophyllum. It's got just bright spore mass and it's, it's, it's uh, a lot of spores. So if you want to do a spore print, that's, the, that's a fun one to look for. It grows in your yard a lot of times. Um, uh, this is an example of an in situ spore print. They, a lot of times, will just drop spores on the ground or on each other. And so this is a pretty, this is a standard spore print for this species. Um, it's it's going to be this salmon orangey color and uh, it's pretty consistent. Uh, here's another one, Entoloma with this spore print. Uh, they're always going to have this kind of pinkish, dull pink uh, spore print. So anyway, here is an example of spores dropping on other mushrooms, dropping all over the ground. Um, this is Marasmius vegas. I think it's fine. You'll see it in your grass. Just got named your other rediscovered employer, I guess. Um, here's the Harrison with the white spore print on the ground. You can see that it's just dropping spores all over the ground. Um, so that's just pretty neat to find. Uh, these are the ones that I was talking about before. They have really bright green spores. They are toxic, uh, not deadly so, but it's not a fun time. Um, but if you see these ones in your yard and you want to practice on making this spore print, uh, I would I would definitely try these ones. They can look really neat. Okay, so making a spore print, uh, you just basically cut the top off and you put it down on a piece of paper or a microscope slide, and then you put a cap on top, or a cup or some kind of thing on top of it that's going to uh, create a lot of humidity in there and the more in the drop their spores on there and then you can remove it after a couple hours. You know, usually I leave it, usually 24 hours is good. Sometimes it doesn't even take that long. It just takes an hour or two. Um, and sometimes they're just wet and old or, or have already dropped their spores or they don't have mature spores yet and, and it'll fail and it'll come back to nothing. It happens all the time. Uh, this is a good little example of a spore print card. You can take some notes on it. It's got black and white section because if you have white spores on a white piece of paper, you're not going to be able to see them very well. So this is kind of good when you can put it in the middle and you know, the white spores will show up on the black section. All right. Thank you, Philip. Uh, if anybody is especially fond of this particular uh, spore print card, you can find this on the Mycological Society of Toronto's website. So Philip made several mentions of using keys or keying out, using spores. And so we're gonna, we're gonna talk about what these dichotomous keys are. And so basically a dichotomous key, it gives you two choices, like yes or no choices. And you just keep going and going more and more specific until you identify the mushroom. Now in the files for this presentation, there is uh, basically a teaching key. It's a very, very basic key to help you learn just how to use a dichotomous key. And I have mine printed out here. So I'm gonna go back in the presentation and just find one of the major morphological groups and key it out. And I encourage you, if you can open that file or print it out and follow along, On way back. Let's look at this in a loam. I'm fond of this one. So the first option in the key is a fruit body with thin flexible gills. Yes, okay. 
So go to number two. Number two, fruit body with gills, blunt gills with cross veins or vein-like ridges on the undersurface. Well, it has gills clearly. So we're gonna go to number three. Three is a fruit body with a cap and stalk or funnel-like shape, undersurface with blunt gill-like to vein-like ridges that are often forked and cross-veined or nearly smooth, usually growing on the ground, but sometimes on wood. That doesn't sound right. Th these are gills for sure. So we're gonna say no to that one and go to the next one, which says fruit body with normal or split or crimped gills. That's number four. So we move on to number four, fruit body small, stalkless. Well, I mean, it's got a stalk. So we know this one's no already. So we're gonna go on to the next one. Fruit body small to large, pretty big. Under surface with thin knife blade like gills radiating from a stalk or on a stalkless species from the point of attachment to the substrate growing on the ground, wood, grass, dung, or a variety of other substrates. So growing on the ground, it checks out, it checks out all the way. And so you would conclude that this is a gilled mushroom, which you could, you know, already tell, but it just demonstrates the use of the dichotomous key. So let's run back there. So I encourage you just to whatever you find, just try using the key. When I teach uh, ID class in person, I like to kind of play musical chairs with different specimens and let everybody key them out. And some, some keys do start with the spore color. You can see that this key from Mushroom Expert, which is a great online resource that I love, starts, you know, guild mushrooms, guild pink spored, guild pale spored, guild dark spored, and then it's going growing on the ground, growing on wood. You just keep narrowing it down by these characteristics. So these are the two field guides that I recommend for our region, definitely. Mushrooms of the Gulf Coast States, it's a, it's a recent book. Both of these are relatively recent. Um, and Mushrooms of the Southeast, the one, the Gulf Coast States one is about twice as big as the Southeast book and it's more specific to our region. Um, and it's still, they're still hefty enough that I wouldn't want to take them out in the field, like Philip said, but rather just make all of these observations and make notes and then bring your specimens back. And these books have the keys in them. And then depending on what you're doing, you might end up with just really, really specialized keys, getting down to spore, spore size and everything. It just gets more and more specific with the different characteristics as you go on. So Mushroom Expert is awesome. I really, really like this as a resource. So he has lots of information about collecting for study and making spore prints and how to, how to keep a mushroom journal and uh, describing odor and taste, distinguishing characteristics like that, pronouncing Latin, if that's a concern of yours. Um, chemical reactions, that's getting into more intermediate mushroom ramification. Um, as is microscopy, preserving specimens. If you get really into it and you want to start drying and keeping the specimens, starting your own fungarium, a, a fungal herbarium, uh, you can do that. And then like, identifying the trees because so many mushrooms grow in relationships with specific trees. Like there's a bull eat the um, Boletinellus murioloides, it's the ash tree bully. It only happens under ash trees. So this is great and a lot of info jam-packed in here. I encourage you to check it out. Additional online resources, mushroomobserver.org. Um, that is where I started. Uh, that is where I upload all my photos to and um, I do recommend it. It's, there are a lot of specialists on there and people are 
pretty happy to assist you. Uh, iNaturalist is interesting. It's kind of like mushroom observer, but for all of nature. Uh, people sometimes prefer iNaturalist to mushroom observer because there is actually uh, a phone app. <laughs> and then there's lots and lots of groups on Facebook. Um, one of the ones that I run is Florida Mushroom and Fungus ID. And you can get extremely specific with some of these Facebook groups. There's one that's dedicated to um, graveyard lichens, lichens that grow on, on tombstones, just very, very specific Facebook groups. Um, so we do have a few minutes. So I am going to discuss three, Ooh. <laughs> hi Heather, um, three of the common edibles that are easy to identify in our area. So chanterelles, uh, these are in the genus Cantharellus. They're terrestrial, they don't grow on wood. If you see an orange mushroom growing on wood, it is not a chanterelle. Um, they're mycorrhizal, they have that relationship with trees, uh, with hardwoods in this case, especially oak trees. And they have the underside that's frequently characterized as false gills. So they look more like folds or ridges or veins or wrinkles. Like Philip said earlier, they can be almost totally smooth on the underside as well. Lots of color diversity here. We get these really bright orange ones in our area, which is excellent because you can spot them on the forest floor. They really stand out against leaves. Um, they can be paler um, and uh, yellow. Some people pick up a, an apricot smell. I don't really get that. Smell is really, really subjective. Sometimes the only thing I can smell is bug spray. Um, and even though they can be so brightly colored on the outside, they're going to have white flesh inside. So the one, the jack-o'-lantern mushroom, Omphalotus, is really the only thing that you would be very concerned about confusing a chanterelle for. It, it has the true gills, it grows on wood, it's orange through and through, and it, it's pretty easy to distinguish these to identify chanterelles. And one of the very fun things is you can peel it down the middle like a piece of string cheese. I call this the string cheese test. Their flesh is very distinctive. You can peel it right down the middle like a piece of string cheese and the flesh on the inside is white. And these are really abundant in our rainy summer months. So if we get some good rain and you go out in an area that has lots of oak trees, you're, you're bound to find some. And I've been returning to the same oak trees year after year and after rains and there they are. This is another distinctive one, very distinctive. It's growing on hardwoods, especially laurel oaks. It's lion's mane, Heresium arenaceus. Um, it almost looks like a soccer ball, <laughs> a volleyball. They're these big rounded clumps of soft white spines becoming yellowish with age. If you find one and it's starting to get yellow, it's probably gonna be acrid or bitter. You don't want the yellow bits. Um, these are, a winter mushroom in our area. I've only seen these in January, February. Um, if you do cook these up, they're kind of like crab meat, but you definitely want to avoid any of the old yellow parts because And then we've seen this fella a few times. Um, this is going to be about the same habitat as chanterelles, you often find them growing together in the same area because they're terrestrial. They're mycorrhizal with oak, the oaks. They're um, growing in a relationship with the roots of oak trees. The kind of peach-like, dull, orange, velvety cap, it can be wrinkled. The gills are pale. Look how far apart these gills are. They're not packed in there. They're widely spaced. And when you handle them, this milk comes out and the milk doesn't change and it doesn't really smell. And these again are abundant in the rainy summer months. So these are three, if you're 
hunting for the table. These are three great easily identified mushrooms in our area. So with that, thank you. We're just in time for Q and A. I am back and I apologize for cutting out earlier. Um, thank you to Philip and Sarah for taking over and getting the presentation started. So the first question is, are there any mushrooms known for dry climates? I feel like most mushrooms are in dark or wet locations. Is that a requirement? Uh, no, there are some desert mushrooms, some agaricus that grow out of the desert. Uh, they're really neat. Um, there's a truffle that grows in the desert in the Middle East uh, under the sand with no apparent vegetation around. Um, so no, that doesn't always have to be moist. They've adapted to pretty much every climate except for Antarctica, I believe so. Um, there are lichens in, in Antarctica though. You so, go. you know. In there. Uh, there, the one that I thought of immediately is um, Bataria phylloides. It's mm -hmm. a desert puffball that can get quite tall, kind of like yeah. freaky tall. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually Bataria phylloides is one of the mushrooms on my list on my 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 goal list. Uh, I, I have I tried to find it in Colorado and the more desert like climates, but no luck yet. But that, that's a good question. Um, thanks for that. Our next question is, um, how would one prepare a microscope slide for fungi without gills or pores? Like, and hopefully I'm saying this right, Xylaria? Oh God, I tried and tried and tried. So I'll let Sarah take this one away. Um, Xylaria, actually, I have lead forays. We've collected fungi will come back, put everything on the table and then start grouping it. And we have had Zellaria on the table for 15 minutes and it will leave a spore print on the table sometimes. So you can take a spore print. Um, so Zellaria, they're ascomycetes and they have like these little microscopic chambers and that's where the, the spores, they trying to, describe it without a diagram or a way to draw it. But you can definitely get spores from Zellaria. You can also take really, really thin slices with a microscope and you can get those parathesia, you can get those chambers. They're pretty cool to look at. Um, often when you're working with something like that, that's kind of crumbly uh, hard to get really thin slices. Uh, a dissecting scope. Dissecting scopes are awesome for just the tiniest work you can imagine. You can get the tiniest li little slivers of anything using a dissecting scope. So I hope that answers your question. So we've, we're getting a lot more questions in now. So uh, the next one is, and I will try to get to everybody's. We are here till 7.30. Um, so we'll do our best to answer your question. If I don't respond to you that I got your question, I'm definitely seeing them. They're just coming in pretty fast right now. So the next question is, how about the computer vision tools or apps where you upload an image and it tries to automatically ID the mushroom? Have you tried them and what has been your experience? I wouldn't rely on them if I was a newbie. I might iNaturalist has a pretty good one. I mean, I might throw something in there if I don't know what it is to see what it says, but a lot of times it's nowhere near close. I mean, they're just so nuanced. There's so many different characteristics to look at. Um, it, it's just never, I, I feel like it's just never going to be able to like, gather all that in an app and give you a correct reason. You know, it could be dangerous because I have seen instances where they have identified a poisonous mushroom as an edible mushroom. And, you know, if you were just kind of taking its word for it, which you shouldn't, um, you could end up in a bit bad situation. So I would say use the keys. Don't use them as picture books. Uh, the keys will teach you how to look at a mushroom um, more so than just flipping through the pages and trying to find something similar. Yeah, I would definitely not take it with a grain of salt for sure. I wouldn't trust it. You can use it as a starting point. You can use it as a starting point. Um, I have seen iNaturalist accurately identify things. I've also seen it not 
<laughs> um, I was shocked. How, I was shocked one time. I was like, you really got that? That's amazing. But yeah, I don't rely on it. <laughs> um, apparently it's pretty good for plants though. Yeah, bugs, oh. moths. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So don't shy away from my naturalist because it's, it's an awesome resource, but um, be careful. I, I, over the years, I've seen mushroom ID apps appear and then disappear very quickly. I don't know if you've seen that pattern as well, Philip, but. Um, I just can ignore them. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a pretty frequently asked question, but I would definitely get a guide. Um, also these two books, I didn't mention it. Uh, both of these, if you're affiliated with the University of Florida, they're available as eBooks. Um, and the Alachua County Public Library System also has them available as eBooks. And I think they have some print copies as well. So definitely look at your local resources. Um, it's, I do recommend the print ones, but if you wanna browse before you buy, that's a, a possibility. So the next question is, what do you use to clean off the grit or dirt from Shantara? I'm sorry if I'm butchering these names. I'm very new to mushroom identification as well. <laughs> um, I think more so the important thing is not to throw um, a sandy mushroom in with the rest of your mushroom. So, um, you know, picking versus cutting a mushroom out of the ground doesn't matter, except for you do want to cut the stem off the chanterelle before you put it in your basket, because if you get one sandy one, you can just get all over a whole bunch. Um, I do feel like chanterelles are kind of hardy, so they can stand up to a little bit of rinsing to get it out of there. Um, I've tried to use everything from a little toothbrush to like an air gun or air pressurized air. And, and really the most important thing is just don't put a sandy mushroom in your in your basket. Sometimes you can't help it because the rain has splattered the mud all up under the gills and you might as well just leave it because I've picked some ones that I've brought them home. I'm like, there's no way I'm getting this clean. So just try to get them clean in the basket. I like with, with chanterelles, I like to collect them just with a pair of scissors and I yeah. snip, snip them at the base and lift them up and just leave that sandy base there. So the best way is just to harvest them as clean as possible. I've been in some situations where I had a very hasty harvest, like maybe it's going to rain and it's just a nightmare trying to... Sandy and gritty. Yeah, and it's even worse if we're talking about milk mushrooms, yeah. if that gets sandy and then the milk and it gets all... Yeah, that's, that's even worse. So try to harvest cleanly from the start. The struggle is real in Florida with all the sugar sand. That is for real. <laughs> Our next question is, how do you propagate a lion's mane? Well, that'd be a whole story of cultivation and cloning and agar and all this stuff beyond this. But you can go online and look up lion's mane grow kit and they'll send you a little box with a lion's mane in it with instructions on how it'll grow right out of there and you can set it right on your counter. I've seen really, I've seen really amazing flushes from those. So that's what I would look at. Now, is that usually on straw or on wood? Cultivation, straight up, is I am not as familiar with it as I should be. <laughs> yeah, like a sawdust block mostly. I don't think straw would be. Straw would be like your oyster mushrooms. Your oysters, okay. Yeah. But um, you're, if you get into propagation, there's all kinds of books about cultivation and propagation, Facebook groups about it. It is a field onto itself, you know. And I will say that if you find a tree or a log that has lion's mane growing from it, wild, uh, you can return. I returned to the same log a few years in a row um, until just eventually the log was just too exhausted and broken down. Um, I would head to, I like North Central Florida um, during the winter time because they have a lot of old laurel oaks that are dying or diseased and that's what you're usually going to find them on. So that's usually where I find them. I don't think they've been found south of maybe Ocala. 
They do like the chillier weather. So we're, we've got a question from YouTube. So I'm going to look at my second screen and ask this question to you guys. Um, it says, I know in the Midwest, we are seeing different species normally found in warmer climates. The going theory is climate change related. Is Florida observing related species shifts? Or are you guys seeing that here? We are. Um, it's likely a combination of factors. Um, we know that hurricanes will introduce spores from Africa, from the Caribbean. Um, and some of it too is that, you know, mycology in Florida has, it's been neglected. Um, our good mushroom season is not pleasant like it is out in California. You know, our, our mushrooms are, our fungi, it's the most diverse in the hot, rainy summer months. And it's not super pleasant um, unless you're used to it. Um, so when we observe a species for the first time, has it been here all along and we just didn't notice it or document it or collect it? Or is it a new, a recent introduction? Um, this one, this Merasmius vagus, uh, which is lots and lots of little orange mushrooms in lawns, has only been in, I think, it, the last 10 years. The last 10 years, and we think it was introduced from Australia by imported mulch. Am I right? That yeah, I mean, probably imported mulch, maybe hurricanes. I know that weather balloons have found spores in the stratosphere. Um, so they get around all kinds of time. I will say that there's a giant polypore that seems to have showed up. And as of like a year ago, there wasn't really any observations of it. And I don't know how anybody could have missed it on a tree. And um, I think that is one instance of a tropical polypore coming to Florida. If you get into South Florida too, you can get into some really interesting ones. Things, my friend just found one that's only been found in Mexico before. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely see them moving around the world, whether it's global warming created, I don't, I don't really know, but you know, they, they, re they release so many spores because they, you know, they want to make sure that they're make sure that they're reproducing. So, and I get around the planet in all kinds of different ways. I mean, even think about migratory birds. Yeah. Um, but yeah, definitely we're, we are always documenting things for the first time. Why it's the first time, it, it's, it's hard to say, but it, it does seem in general that ranges are shifting. Um, just two, two numbers of factors. That's a good question. Our next question is, is there a poisonous lookalike for the milk caps? Not every milk cap is necessarily edible. So <laughs> just because you scratch the gills and it releases some sort of liquid does not mean that it's edible. I don't, there's some, some slightly toxic ones that will make you sick. Um, but for the most part, if you look at that, that one's really going to be one. That's going to be one of your most prolific ones here. But I can't think of anything. I mean, especially when you're talking about like Lactarius indigo, the blue yeah. milky mushroom. I mean, that is so distinctive, so incredibly distinctive. Um, I mean, there are some milky caps where the the milk is like there's Lactarius piperatus, peppery. Yeah. And you touch the tip of your tongue to a bead of that milk and you'll remember it. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. Yeah, you're not going to want to eat that one. But um, I, I don't really, I think it depends on how reckless you are. Yeah, don't try to make something it isn't. You know, if I, I see a lot of that with beginners is they find a mushroom and they want it to be chanterelle or milk cap. But if they would have really taken even a few minutes to, you know, Google or go on Mushroom Observer or something, it would be pretty obvious that it's not what they're looking for. So that's a big thing is just don't try to make something it isn't. I mean, we always say that the jack-o'-lantern, that omphalotus is the toxic lookalike of a chanterelle. And, and I can't understand how somebody could confuse them. I mean, one grows on the ground, one grows on wood. The inside color is different. The gills are different. It's just they're they both can be orange, 
again, just trying to make something it is, and I guess. Yeah. Um, don't eat anything, obviously, that you're not 100% on. And there are lots of people who'd be happy to help you identify things. Yeah, we're both very active on that, on some of these mushroom groups, fungus identification. Or, um, so yeah, feel free to post on there with good pictures. Good detail. Yes, please take as many photos as you can. All angles, the underside, we need to see the whole stem with the base, any ring, all the stuff that we talked about today that you want to document that in your photographs. Our next question is, I have heard conflicting info about whether or not chicken mushrooms grow here. So the question is, do they? <laughs> well, are we talking about chicken fat, chicken of the woods? See, this is why the, pop, this is why the common names can be uh, confusing. Gotcha. Uh, so whoever asked that question, if you want to send in something a little bit more clarifying, I can re-ask it. I do have a local latiparis, which is chicken of the woods in one of the slides here. And if that person can confirm that this is what they're talking about, um, our friend Curtis, this is his hand. This is, he found this locally. And I have found what they call chicken of the woods, latiparis. I have found that here. Now there's something else that they call hen of the woods. We have lots of birds, poultry. Birds. I mean, we have things that people call shrimp of the woods. We have things people call lobster mushrooms. <laughs> we uh, common names can get messy and confusing, but chicken of the woods we have here. Hen of the woods we don't. Again, that's another like mid Georgia sort of thing. Okay, so uh, if that person, yes, uh, they did, they wrote in, she says, yes, that, that one on the bottom right. Yes, we most certainly do get that here. Excellent. Okay, um, so what mushroom or fungi is the easiest in Florida to take the rookies, uh, it says, chance to eat and saute that taste well? So... I'm not sure that question was a little hard to read, but. I would, chanterelles, milk caps, lion's mane, those were three good ones that you can't, shouldn't be able to misidentify. Yeah, I mean, we if you're taking a group of newbies, careful. Yeah, we covered those for, for a reason because they are so distinctive. I'm trying to think, did I? No, I didn't put honey mushroom. Honey mushroom season is coming. It's here. It is upon us. <laughs> um, and we don't have, I don't think I put any photos of them in the presentation. Um, they, they're here. <laughs> um, uh, Polish and Ukrainian folks call them papinki. And oh. I'll often hear from people on walks like, oh, my grandma collected papinki. What is that? And that's a honey mushroom. It's armillaria. And it is a significant plant pathogen. Um, it grows, it, it's destructive. Uh, that, that humongous fungus out in Oregon, that's our malaria, that's a honey mushroom. And as destructive as they are to trees, they can be eaten and they're pretty good. I put some in a soup recently. Um, the stems are tough. You only want the cap and you wanna cook it really, really well. Um, just because of the, its roughage, uh, you want to make sure that you can break that chitin in the cell wall down because you wouldn't want to eat a crab shell. It's just hard to digest. <laughs> um, but yeah, look, I would hmm? look up ringless honey mushroom if you're out there watching. They're pretty easy to identify. And like Definitely. she said, they are everywhere. Right now, so and I'm cool. probably, we've been getting enough ID requests on that one just recently, just in the last week that I'm probably going to create a post on our Facebook group about it. But honey mushrooms, our malaria, ringless honey mushroom, you'll see them and they appear in big clumps. So, you know, you'll have more than just a little garnish if you find those and decide to prepare them. 
and I've just put the the link to to your Facebook page in the chat. I'm gonna put it over in YouTube in a minute, so folks who want to learn more about the group can can check it, you guys out on Facebook. Um, but we've got some more questions, uh, so I'm gonna keep going. Uh, the next question is, let's see here. Uh, you guys are still sending them in, which is great. Um, how good are true gills and the partial membrane ring on the stem an indicator for poisonous mushrooms? I don't really understand. I think it would be best to say that there are no hard, fast rules about what's poisonous and what's edible. There's no feature that all poisonous mushrooms have. There's a book out there that says stay away from gilled mushrooms. It's just the only way to do it is learn how to identify your mushroom and then research the edibility and then verify it with somebody that is an expert. Uh, that's what I, my suggestion would be. I will say that if you see these uh, pure yeah. white mushrooms, you know, a lot of times we think of bright colors being a warning sign like, oh, these stink horns are bright red, so they must be toxic. No, I mean, they stink but they're not deadly toxic. These kind of innocuous looking, kind of angelically white. Um, this is, they call them destroying angels. Uh, it's a section of Amanita and you'll notice that there's a cup. It's all white. There's no warts or anything. There's not really all of that snowy, snowy flocose material, no scraps really hanging here. And they'll usually have a skirt. And this is red flags, lots of red flags. Yeah, don't. Yeah, like the, this, this will kill you. This will destroy your liver. Um, so anything really with a cup and a skirt and all white, stay away. But there's no tell, there's no, I mean, I hear all sorts of, <laughs> folklore. I hear, oh, well, my grandma taught me that if you put a silver spoon or a silver coin in a pan of, of mushrooms and it turns black, then it's toxic. No, that's, there, there's no shortcuts. You just have to learn your mushrooms. All right. And a question from you too. What characteristics might suggest that a mushroom is old or past its prime for picking? Bugs. Lots of bugs buzzing around it, falling out of the gills. Fungus nets, yeah. <laughs> sometimes they're eaten by the hypomyces we talked about before, so they're just covered in like this gross mold. And sometimes they're just waterlogged, you know, and old and crusty. But those... Yeah, and sometimes they'll look fine, and then you cut them down the middle, and they're filled with maggots. And yeah, I mean, unfortunately, with the climate in Florida, the bugs in the heat will get them quickly sometimes. I mean, we get oyster mushrooms wild here, but it's very rare to find them in a condition that you'd actually want to eat because they just are, they're pretty delicate and the bugs get them quick and the heat gets them quick and they just get, well, oh. so use your senses as if it smells gross or if it feels slimy or gross or if, if it's just not right. Yeah, a lot of the oyster mushrooms are like, they're like, it smells like seafood. I'm like, well, that's probably more decomposition than any identification characteristic. So you got a mushroom that kind of smells like, now there are fishing mushroom lactarius that just smell like that just because it aren't rotten. Um, lactarius are actually a good one too. They, they usually kind of hold up to the bugs. They usually can kind of not be eaten all the way through. Some may think that's why they even produce milk keep bugs from eating them because it's sticky and all that kind of stuff. Okay, our next question, um, I'm moving around a little bit. Uh, let's see, what is the largest mushroom you have encountered in Florida and what region was it located in? I've never found it, so I'll let you talk about it. Macrosibi titans. Macro as in big, Cybe as in head or cap. And then Titans like Titanic. So this, <laughs> this mushroom scientific name literally means like great big cat. <laughs> and it's known to occur in Florida and just Florida and Africa, right? 
pretty sure. And, but if you've seen, Alabama you know, stuff. I just, I know that it, because of our climate, it does occur just in Florida. You're not going to see this north of here. But if you've ever seen those photos of people holding up gigantor mushrooms and you're thinking, yeah, nice forced perspective, nice Photoshop. No, they're really huge, ridiculously big mushrooms. Um, our friend John in Orlando found one growing in a parking garage. And I still don't know how that happened. I would definitely would not eat it if it was growing in a parking garage because of all the, the runoff and the heavy metals. But um, definitely Macrosity Titans. We don't really have a common name for it, but- I was just trying to think of one and I couldn't really- No. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a fun one. Um, and I know people who will take the cap and basically use it like a pizza crust because it it's big enough for it. <laughs> Is it more work to cultivate your own mushrooms or forage for them in the woods? Depends what you enjoy. Um, <laughs> it depends on what you enjoy and what you want to do. Um, uh, and, cultivating mushrooms is a lot of work. It uh, is. There's a huge learning curve. There's sterile techniques and some pressure cooking and some substrate preparation. And then you, after you do all that and you're ready to fruit, there's some climate control, some humidity control. Um, but you'll get more consistent mushrooms than if you just rely on foraging because you know, sometimes the mushrooms just aren't out. It hasn't been wet enough. Uh, hasn't been hot enough, especially in Florida, there's a good chance that it's full of bugs. Um, so I would say they're just kind of unrelated. Like, like if you really, really love oyster mushrooms, if you yeah. love them that much that you would want to cultivate them, I mean, that's probably a better bet than foraging and hoping that you might find some that aren't disgusting. <laughs> Um, yeah, but shiitake, shiitake logs are pretty straightforward, though. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, plugging logs with shiitakes and oyster mushrooms. I've done both of those, and those are pretty consistent. Yeah, um, it's kind of like a, a passive thing, because you you plug the logs, and then a year later... <laughs> yeah, you just walk out one day, and you're like, oh, wow. Um, it's fun to get into, but it's very complicated. You have you really want to buy a book? Get on YouTube and just you know just start watching and reading everything you can. Lots sense. of resources um, <laughs> in the cultivation community. So this is a question about uh, your group. Uh, do either of you or both of you give talks or foraging tours in North Florida? And if so, how do we sign up for one? Oh. I try, <laughs> but timing it right with the weather and like the last one I had was gonna be super great and I went out and all the trails were knee deep in water. So if you wanna follow, there's a falafel North Florida chapter and I'm trying to be more active as far as giving walks. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I mean, if, you were, if you reach out to me directly and you know of some place or especially if you have a big property somewhere like I definitely have been known to just drive you know, an hour or two away to go hang out on somebody's property with them and walk around and talk about their mushrooms. So last summer, I was doing a walk every weekend and it was really awesome. But just with, with the current situation um, and, you know, you find a mushroom, you hold it up and then everybody look at it. And I, it's, that's just not happening right now. Um, I, there's got a little, lot of great spots. The problem with North Florida is that it's a lot of pine trees with a lot of dirt roads that go through the pine trees and you're really not going to find too much in that kind of environment. You need a mixed hardwood, old oak growth. And then uh, a lot of the places are state parks or conservation areas where collecting is a no-no. Yes. Be careful with that. <laughs> And, and we actually, this is how Sarah and I know each other, but Sarah had reached out to do a walk with Alachua Conservation Trust, and then unfortunately the pandemic happened and we weren't able to do that. So 
when things get back to normal, I am sure that we will probably do a walk together on one of ACT's preserves um, in the right ecosystem and also at the right time. So you can always just follow um, both Sarah and Philip's group and then also ACT. And hopefully when things get back to normal, we'll have a, a mushroom walk where everybody can come out and, and learn uh, firsthand as well. There is say I will say traveling to forays has been really beneficial to me as far as knowledge wise, like traveling to Georgia, traveling to North Carolina and going to these big, big forays where they have the national experts at. Those have been some of the most valuable information that I've ever received. If, if resources you know, are there to do that. There is a Facebook group called Mushroom Meetups that is, I think, majority Floridian. And often people will say, I'm in such and such county, would somebody like to go on a walk? And maybe you can find some pals that way as well. But I, I do hope to resume walks soon. It's gonna be getting dry soon. Um, yeah, so yeah it's, like it's been a bummer, just a summer with, with no mushroom forays or walks, but soon. One day. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Hopefully, hopefully one day we will get back to that. Um, so we're going to do one more question. I'm sorry that I did not get to everybody's, um, but if you have more questions, you can definitely check out group these groups on Facebook and post those questions there. Um, so the last question that we're going to ask tonight is, Are uh, this actually was in response to the last one, but are there any mushrooms that do grow in association with pines or not, just not in planted pine forests? Probably one of the closest elites we get to Porcini, Studio Pinephilus, I think something like that. That grows in with pine trees. Some Swilius, Swilius that grow with pine yeah. trees. It's like Swilius. I mean, one of the good things, if you look at photos and you see pine needles, that, that's a pretty good sign. Um, I know, now, was this question specifically about edibles or not? It, it, it didn't say, so. Okay. Cool, where is my, these guys here associate with pine. Yeah. So you can see all of these pine needles, like definite pine association here. As far as edibles, there's, and this is not a beginner edible, but the C Florida's version of the Amanita Caesar, the Caesar's Amanita, true ones in Europe or wherever. But we do have someone right here and they grow along pine. And, uh, they're delicious. Great. So we're, we're at 730. There are so many great questions. Thank you, everybody who submitted them. I want to say thank you so much to Philip and Sarah for being here and, and doing this uh, webinar for us. I certainly learned a lot um, and I'm looking forward to learning more. Uh, for, uh, for those of you who are interested in attending another webinar, I've posted the link to our next one, which is actually on conservation easements. It's something that ACT uh, is doing to help protect land. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about that, you can register for the event. It's on November 10th. Uh, but otherwise, please feel free to check out, uh, check out the groups that I've posted in the chat. I've tried to put links on YouTube as well. Um, and, and once again, I just want to say thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Philip. Just a wonderful presentation. Thank you, guys. This was fun. Yes. All right. Hopefully we'll be out here in person one of these days doing a mushroom walk together. I so look forward to that. Um, for, but for now, we've got this on YouTube. You can share it, check it out, let your friends know about it. It'll be available right after this talk. So thanks for coming. Thank you for being here tonight. And I hope everybody enjoys the rest of their evening.